Okay, so let's get started with the webinar. I want to say welcome to Sheku's first webinar. Good morning to the Americans listening in. Good afternoon or evening for those joining us from outside America. So the purpose of today's meeting uh, of the 30 to 40 minutes webinar is just to summarize for you the main findings from a publication Sheku has published just very recently, in fact, last week. It's also the first time that we present this full publication to the public and that shows that we attach great value to the webinar as a tool to reach all our partners around the world. Uh, we could normally not talk to that easily. It's also to inform you that this is the start of Sheku's webinar series, which we intend to organize on a more regular basis from now on. So right before I start, if you have any interesting topics and speakers, if you want to represent your organization in any future webinar, we are happy to hear from you at uh, webinar at checo.com. Before I get started uh, talking to you about the content from the Guide North America, I want to hand over to my colleague Robert. So we are two from Checo uh, leading this webinar today. Uh, Robert has not only worked with me on the guide for natural refrigerants, so he's also a knowledge, knowledge resource we can use today, uh, but he's also the host of today's webinar and he can explain to you a little bit how you can contribute uh, to today's session. Over to you, Robert. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, as Nina mentioned, I'm Robert and I was a author on this guide, but today I will be looking after your questions and answers and your chat. So just to go over some of the options you have in how you can contribute to this webinar, uh, you can see a screenshot just before you of audio settings Q&A chat and raise hands. So if you would like, uh, thank you Tom, uh, if you would like to ask a question in the Q&A tab, you may do so at any time. We'll keep clarification and content uh, questions until the end of the webinar in the Q&A section. But if you have a technical question or something you would like uh, to be addressed, then I will be monitoring at all times and I will answer that specifically by myself through the text as opposed to answering it live. Um, we are aware that some people using older version of Zoom might not have these functions, but we also have an online chat which you can talk with other uh, participants. And also we might at some point ask you to raise your hand and also this is again for the newer version and this can help us with, uh, with questions we may have regarding technical issues and whether you can hear. But I hope you all enjoy it and I will leave this back to Nina. Thanks, Robert. So um, before I get started on, on the content, uh, just a few words about us. Uh, some of you, um, I don't know who joined us today, but some of you might not know who we are. So just very briefly, two slides about us. We call ourselves Market Accelerator for Climate Friendly Technologies. We, our European headquarters is in, in Brussels. Uh, we have an office in New York, in Tokyo, and an associate company in Berlin. Our focus is on the HVAC and R industry and their unnatural refrigerants. So we started 15 years ago with CO2 and then went into the areas of ammonia, hydrocarbons, water and air. We work with 100 plus clients around the world. This is a conservative estimate because the industry is definitely growing. Sheku is active in three areas, media, events and market development. And just to give you a short overview of what uh, we are active in the Sheko Media part branch. The team is working on our industry platforms. Um, the first one we launched in 2006 was r74.com on CO2 as natural refrigerants. And it was then followed by hydrocarbons21.com, ammonia21.com, r718.com on water as a refrigerant. Sheko Media is also the one that is responsible or is going to be responsible for the webinars going forward. And most recently is uh, the leading branch for the Accelerate magazine, which we launched for the American market and the Japanese market. For the Sheko events, some of you might have joined us already for the atmosphere conferences. We organize in different parts of the world. There is a smaller format as well called Atmosphere Network. And the last, not least, um, 
is Sheko Market Development, the area where I'm responsible for the guide Sheko Publications, which we talk about today as a product of uh, that team, as well as the Natural Wise, which is a global campaign uh, on behalf of natural refrigerants, and the Circle Meetings, which are smaller meetings and face-to-face -face meetings. We are also active in regulatory affairs and market research. Okay, this should be all about us. So let's jump right into the content, the Guide North America. Well, two years ago in 2013, uh, Sheko launched the first market overview report for natural refrigerants in North America. We set out to capture for the first time a market map uh, to show the market penetration of CO2 refrigeration, food stores using CO2 refrigeration in Canada and the USA. We also outlined the situation for light commercial or what uh, you would call the food service sector and featured an interview an industry survey to depict the state of the industry today and for future expectations. So why a guide 2015? Um, because the North American market for natural refrigerant is one Sheko has watched with keen interest uh, since then. Uh, we have organized five dedicated conferences to bring together end users, suppliers and legislators. We have opened an office in the US we have, and we have seen through our activities that the market for natural refrigerant is growing, new players entering the market of new solutions every year. However, we found that it's difficult to quantify exactly how much progress has been made just from that. That's why we set out to do it again, to work on a new completely updated version of the guide. It was needed because uh, the dynamic market developments in the last 2.5 years in several sectors since the last publication showed us that more and more efforts are driven uh, by uh, consumer good brands, by food retailers, by the cold storage industry. And more and more stakeholders are becoming involved and active. Um, we're talking about component suppliers, system manufacturers, contractors, but also regulators, power utilities or research organizations. We decided to focus our attention uh, in three feature chapters in the guide 2015. Um, it's, this is the food service sector, commercial refrigeration and industrial refrigeration. Why is that? Because on the food service sector, and as I will explain in a few seconds, it's one of the most exciting sectors to watch. There's internal competition uh, coming up between natural refrigerants, namely CO2 and hydrocarbons. In commercial refrigeration, uh, we're also seeing a move towards CO2. It's becoming a standard in some regions and, on its, and it's on its way to becoming a standard in others. And last but not least, industrial refrigeration is driven, well, ammonia is a mainstream solution there, but now there we see a strong drive towards low charge ammonia systems, a future uptake of CO2, and partly hydrocarbons as well. So to summarize here, uh, we try to uh, improve the publication by putting more emphasis on market maps, on uh, infographics, on interviews to make it more relevant for the reader. It's part of the Accelerate brand, as I will explain uh, later on, it was launched as a special edition this month. As always, um, as it is the case of all our guides before, it's free to download, it's, uh, you're free to read it online and share it. Before I get uh, into the content here, I want to just say thank you to the 18 market leaders in, uh, in natural refrigerants um, active in North America because without them, the product would have not been um, possible. It took uh, several months to work on this. It's quite challenging. And so very happy to have the support of the of these market leaders. It also shows us that the market is more and more growing and more uh, companies are becoming active in that area and interested in building a business case around that. Okay, so one of the first things we, we do in these guides is to what we call uh, depict them in terms of ecosystems. So we came up with different ecosystems, one on city and buildings, one on the industry and special applications, and one on the food chain. And this is the one that shows you the uh, situation for the food chain in North America. I put this up because it shows that this is one of the most dynamic industry sectors overall. We're here talking about uh, ammonia and CO2 and cargo ship transport. We are talking about 
CO2 becoming uh, available on the market for refrigerated transport for trucks. We are talking about the whole sector of food production, food processing and cold storage where ammonia is a mainstream solution is now being challenged by lower charge solutions by CO2 systems and partly also by hydrocarbons. And we're also talking about commercial refrigeration, about food retail, where C2 in centralized systems and hydrocarbons in display units is, uh, is a viable opportunity, uh, viable technology. And down to domestic refrigerators and freezers, where North America is, is the last big world region to take that um, technology up. Uh, since uh, more than 600 million, I believe, of hydrocarbon systems are running around the world. So this shows you that things are happening, but let me now go into more detail now for the individual items. Again, we did a survey on market trends, and I want to show you some of the main results from this. Most respondents, it's not really a surprise, two-thirds come from the U.S., that, uh, but uh, maybe something to notice that more and more respondents also coming from outside North America responding. Uh, maybe that's an indication that they are becoming more active at, uh, on the North American market. They see a business opportunity there. So Mexico a little bit res less represented, Canada 17%. One thing to note for the respondents profiles is also that the highest response rates comes from the commercial and industrial sized applications. And I guess that's an indication for the high dynamics for natural refrigerants and larger size equipment for refrigeration, air conditioning and heating. Because the domestic, the transport and the mobile sectors were significant, significantly less represented here. One of the first questions we asked, and this is important because it shows us how the situation is evolving over time, is how familiar are you with natural refrigerants? Overall, what we can note is that the familiarity with natural refrigerants is above average, but there's room for improvement, especially for CO2. Hydrocarbons um, enjoy the highest form of familiarity among the respondents. Maybe that's an indication or reflection of the established or increasing use of hydrocarbons in the US and Canada and in Mexico. We were asking about the barriers and the drivers for the uptake of natural refrigerants. So on the, on the good side, on the pro side, why to use them? Uh, efficiency and performance uh, is the highest ranked factor at the same level as compliance with current and future legislation and the environmental impacts. So we're talking about direct and indirect emissions. On the downside, why people hesitate uh, using them right now, we see the capital costs playing a big role. So we're talking about higher initial costs as compared to more established, often AFGAS-based solutions. This is a top, um, top reason why to hesitate for their use. However, what we can expect looking at the international, national, and regional move to phase out HCFCs and phase down HFCs the price of synthetic refrigerants will increase and the cost curve at the same time for um, natural refrigerant technology will most likely come down as it happened in several applications in several countries before. So more competitors offering solutions at higher quantities. Safety um, being ranked as the second highest barrier is also still on people's minds. So more needs to be done in terms of educating and closing the skills gap. But just to note that this does not only exist in North America and is certainly not only limited to natural refrigerant, but seems to be a key challenge for the h r industry overall. And this, an interesting finding though is that demand and competitive advantage is ranked highly by those with an investment in natural refrigerants, but it also ranks at the same time as a major barrier for those that have not yet taken a step into that direction. So really, the, the, the result here is depending on your involvement in that business and the, the perspective might change very quickly. Future plans for natural refrigerants, well, we ask those that are currently not using them, if they want to do that in the future and the big big blue part of 54% shows you that these are the ones that are not using natural refrigerant but that plan to use them in the future, so more than half of the respondents. The most promising 
the most promising developments we can expect for CO2 by 2020, but uh, also hydrocarbons are expected to be taken up in the next four years. An interesting result here is also that um, a third of the respondents were not yet decided if they will use natural refrigerants or if they not, if they won't use it. So there's a large potential untapped. Policy and standards. Well, this is a very important topic. It's one of the major drivers always for the uptake of, of technology, of new technology. And what you can see on the, on the left, left side on the graphics is uh, the result of a spontaneous live polling we did at the last Atmosphere America 2015 conference. So what we did, we, we asked the, the participants, gave them these different options and asked them, so what do you think has the highest impact on the uptake of natural refrigerants? And you can see here that the US EPA SNAP program has the highest impact followed by the HCFC phase out at the international level and uh, by initiatives taken at the state or the province level, just for example, in, in California. The DOE, the Department of Energy, Energy Conservation Standards, then ranks fourth. And voluntary industry commitment, clear message here, it won't drive the market uh, much further. They won't be enough to, to give the real momentum to the market. So let me just explain on the first four items to give you a little bit of perspective on how that would affect the market. This is a table just summarizing the situation for various uh, application sectors. The US Environmental Protection Agency announced the delisting of R144A, 404A, 407A, and other high GWP HFCs and some major applications. Among them, vending machines, supermarket systems, standalone units, and mobile air conditioning. So companies opting for C2 ammonia hydrocarbons can directly transition to future-proof solutions. And um, on the other side, so there's the delisting of HFCs and there is the listing of natural refrigerants uh, that, um, that can open the, the market uh, to, to use these alternatives. When we talk about the HCFC phase out, so we're talking about the international level. What we try to depict here is the situation for the US and Canada on one side and for Mexico on the other side. So USA, Canada have to reach near close to 100% HCFC reduction under the Montreal Protocol in the next four or five years. Mexico has a little bit more time to do the same. And uh, the overall message is that replacements are urgently needed to substitute, especially R22, that will decrease in use and rise in price. So more competitive solutions need to be found. When we talk about the regional incentives or the regional mechanisms that drive the market, two provinces or states um, stand out. That's first of all, California. Uh, who wants to reduce Afghan emissions by 80% by 2030. We also know that uh, they will launch a short-lived climate pollutant plan very soon, actually, I guess in the next coming days, to reduce HFC consumption and on the other side provide incentives to those companies invested in providing alternatives, including natural refrigerants. On the other side, more to the north in Canada, Quebec has the highest concentration of CO2 transcritical systems in commercial and industrial refrigeration and also in low charge ammonia systems. This has been the result of a um, proactive refrigeration program the, the Canadian state has introduced uh, a few years ago and this has uh, provided support to energy efficient systems but also more recently specifically for the uptake of co2 solutions there so the main message here is that regional initiatives can help kickstart the natural refrigerant market not only in the specific areas but they can then more importantly create a spillover effect on other regions and other countries so drive the market as a whole um, at, at a broader scope and last not least for the policy effects here is the Department of Energy, Energy Conservation Standards. There's, they apply to self-contained units and display cases on one side and to ice makers on the other side. And the energy conservation standards set are quite ambitious. 
So we are talking about 30 to 50% of energy reduction by March 2017. And uh, a direct result of that effort has been a renewed interest in using hydrocarbons for small units delivering on the required energy savings. We've seen this development uh, when we attended several trade shows this year in North America and also through the presentations at the Atmosphere Conference in, in June. So interest is definitely there and uh, the, the pressure to do something on the energy conservation side. This is a little bit a complex exercise here. It is a, is a table which is called commercial availability in the US. So what Sheko did here, the policy team, we analyzed taking into account all the different market trends, the technology trends and the policy effects, which kind of sector would move forward when it comes to the use of natural refrigerant very fast or at a slower pace. So we see that domestic, light commercial and commercial in the next one, two years, the market is going to be a mature one. There will be wide commercial availability. That's what we can expect of uh, several competitors being on the market with sufficient production capacity. Industrial is not, uh, is not a headache. It's uh, the use of ammonia is there. It's being challenged internally with low charge ammonia systems, CO2. And uh, so this is uh, widely commercially available. And road transport is another interesting sector where there is uh, there are companies currently trialing these solutions and we can expect in the next uh, three, five years to, to have more commercially available solutions there. When we talk about air conditioning, heating solutions, situation overall looks a little bit less uh, confident right now, as far as we can see from today's perspective. Maybe the most promising here uh, on the chiller side, on the commercial and industrial heat pump side. And one important area as well, one interesting area is definitely the residential heat pumps for water heating using CO2, for example. A runaway success in Japan, um, runaway success probably in China in the next few years. And this would be something that is an interesting market opportunity for North America as well. Okay, talking about the three key chapters we focused our attention on in the guide starting with light commercial refrigeration so the smallest equipment here we calculated the number of units currently being placed on the north american market including mexico and um, as i was saying before mexico has to also comply with the montreal protocol requirements and they have discovered hey, hydrocarbons is one of those ways to comply with these requirements so the use of hydrocarbons is very pronounced there and generally speaking with 188,000 units, the market is a, is a big one, is a mature one. For the US is, is less, but it's, it's coming, it's growing steadily. Again, here the use of hydrocarbons is more pronounced than for CO2. And in Canada, the total number is lower. And interestingly here, this, the CO2 use is higher than the hydrocarbon use. If we want to summarize the main messages here, this is a huge market increase. And when we did that last time, so two, three years ago, we just calculated 16,000 HFC free units being placed across all these three countries. We are now talking about 291,000. So this is 17 times more than three years ago. It's a rapidly growing market. It will further accelerate with all these market and regulatory changes we are seeing right now. So in total, at the global level, more than 4.3 million HFC-free units worldwide. And um, what you can find in the guide here is this time is a new, uh, new item we introduced. It, we, we put out chart profiles of leading consumer good brands. We, outlined what the global fleet would be using natural refrigerant, what the North American fleet is, and what their refrigerant of choice is. So we looked at Coca-Cola, Starbucks, McDonald's, Unilever, Red Bull, and PepsiCo. So going back to the survey we conducted, uh, the result shows that more than 50% majority thinks that natural refrigerant solutions will be fully commercially available next year, as from next year onwards, and 90 plus percent think that full commercialization will be done in the next three years. 
trend will accelerate again with the EPA SNAP approval of hydrocarbons and various applications, the delisting of HFCs on the other side and the DOE energy efficiency standards, as I mentioned before. So very positive outlook here. Coming to commercial refrigeration, an exercise we did uh, two, three years ago already, uh, which we improved now, is these kind of market maps where we show by state or by province the uptake of CO2 secondary cascade, cascade stores. Um, and uh, the main message here is that uh, as compared or the comparison between Canada and the US, the US is hitting the 200 mark of CO2 secondary cascade stores as we speak. Most proactive states here are California and Texas. But the use, if you can look at the map and see the colors, is now spread across most of the U.S. states. Canada stays at a very low 17 stores, Quebec taking again 10 out of those. So generally speaking, there's a higher share of CO2 cascade solutions in, in the south and warm ambient climate, warm ambient temperatures than it is in the north. This time we also did something where we asked uh, these suppliers and the end users to outline how the market has developed or how the number of stores has developed over the last two, three years. And this is the situation 2013, 2014. So we can see the, the steady market growth. Canada, as I was saying, has remained at a very low stable level in the last three years. So not really an uptake of CO2 cascade secondary systems. The U.S. has increased, though, from 113 to 199 stores in the last two years. But generally speaking, market uptake is not as dynamic as for other sectors or other solutions. The same map, just for CO2 transcritical stores, uh, updated just uh, one, two months ago. The situation changes. Uh, Canada's here the leader as compared to the U.S. with more than 130 stores. Out of that, again, Quebec takes 94, and it's due to one of the food retailers leading that effort, and in this case, is Sobeys. The most proactive U.S. state is, again, California. So we see that these two, Quebec and California, really um, making a step forward and when it comes to the use of natural refrigerants in different applications. So the situation is worse, as I was saying, the north uh, is leading. So in, uh, in lower ambient temperatures and colder climates, the use of CO2 transcritical stores is more pronounced. Again, the same slide as before, showing how the market has evolved over the last two years. Canada, had only 37 stores by the end of 2012. So we see an increase of plus 100 stores in three years, which is, is a very good growth rate. And the USA had no CO2 store by end of 2012. So we are looking at an increase of 52 stores being added in the last three years. And it's a little bit of more dynamic de developments we can see here in the transcritical market especially as more and more suppliers are working on providing solutions for warmer climate temperatures from warmer climates or higher ambient temperatures a third of respondents thinks that uh, natural refrigerant solutions will be fully commercially available like as of next year and close to 90 percent think that they will be fully commercially available in the next four years so it's a little bit more hesitant than for light commercial or for the food service sector, but it's still very confident, the industry. The trend here will accelerate with a trend towards warmer climates, as I was saying, as we can see in Europe or in other regions as well. More and more solutions are being developed for meeting the needs of higher ambient temperatures and also the delisting of high GWP gases by the US EPA. It's always good to get a global perspective on how are we. Uh, this is an updated map. We update this quite uh, regularly. We did that just before the launch of the Guide North America again. Some of the main messages here, uh, Europe still leading in terms of CO2 transcritical solutions, a very stable growth is a very large growth where we are looking at 5,200 stores using these solutions this is a conservative estimate 
And the next challenge, as I was saying, developing technologies that make CO2 being effective in Spain and in, in, in southern climates. There are three hotspots that have emerged on the world map. It's Europe, it's Asia, mostly Japan, with 1,000 stores, and uh, North America on the other side. But what we need to understand is that there, we are talking about different technologies. For example, in Japan, the 1,000 stores is mostly related to convenience stores, so sto smaller store formats, whereas in, in Europe and North America, we are talking more about medium-sized to large store formats. And also, of course, when it comes to um, using cascade versus transcritical systems. South Africa and Indonesia stand out again, as a result of individual food retailers drive to go CO2. Uh, and interesting areas also New Zealand and Australia. That's why we decided to organize a first conference on the Australian market next year. Okay, talking about the last feature application sector here, industrial refrigeration. Some of the trends are mentioned before as well. We, we are looking at the R22 phase out schedule taking effect on the end users not yet using ammonia. There is a move towards low charge ammonia systems where we are looking at no charge amounts being applied to the users of such systems. There is less of a refrigerant cost and higher safety, safety levels, of course and the use of CO2 in cascade and secondary ammonia CO2 systems, the use of CO2 transcritical systems, and generally speaking, move towards more energy efficient installations. For the first time, we expanded our data collection also to the industrial refrigeration area because we saw that uh, the dynamic developments would make it very interesting to focus on applications that are not pure ammonia systems, but that promise more state-of-the-art or newer type of technologies being developed. So this map here shows the use of CO2, either transcritical or in, in, in terms of cascade on CO2 secondary systems. What we can note here is um, Canada is leading again, but that was mentioned before on the CO2 transcritical system side, whereas the USA is, is betting more on cascade secondary systems right now. Mexico has, has also started very um, slowly to use natural refrigerant in that area. This map is for showing ammonia low charge systems. We heard that especially Quebec, where we have 56, Ontario 46 applications, has, has provided incentives for the uptake of low charge ammonia systems, and we can see that in the total numbers being reflected. And the use amongst uh, the, uh, among the US states is quite widespread, so there's no single state really standing out. Again, when we look at the market trends, a very strong ma majority, 78% thinks that natural refrigerants will gain market share in the industrial refrigeration sector in the next four or five years. The trend will accelerate with the HCFC phase out at the international level, safety considerations to lower ammonia charge at high efficiency levels, keeping the same efficiency levels at, uh, at higher safety levels. So this uh, is, all from my side on the um, on the constant side for the guide north america i just wanted to add a few slides uh, how you can get more information okay so just to summarize here again to repeat you can read the report online you can download it for free there are various sources where you can get it from either from the publications page from the accelerate page or from issue it is uh, easy to download and view online also, other sources of knowledge. Um, we published a guide on the Chinese market earlier this year in May. So if you're interested in that area, feel free to, to find it at this link. And we will launch another guide on Japan later this year. Something that we are really excited about for next year is that um, since training always stands out as one of the main barriers, not only in North America, not only for natural refrigerants, generally speaking so we thought it would 
be a very good idea to focus a, a guide specifically on that topic, to outline the situation, to look at the market trends going forward, and to most importantly provide a training directory so that the reader would know where to go to, which kind of training is offered where. Because we always get these questions through the online platforms we run, and most of the questions are related to training. So what we intend to do here to create this reference for the HVAC and R industry and to use the refrigerants, ammonia, CO2, hydrocarbons in a safe and compliant way to conduct a survey again and to provide this kind of directory. So a direct call to all the ones listening in is that we will soon launch a global survey on natural refrigerants training asking where this would be available on in which format it is provided and what the situation is by country. And uh, we would really like to get your input. So if you have anything to say, please watch out for the survey. The first two editions, as you can see on the slide, will focus on North America and Europe because these are two of the most dynamic and, and biggest markets. If you want to meet us, uh, there are different events we organize next year, starting with the Atmosphere Asia event in February. It's the third edition being held in Tokyo, the Atmosphere Europe event in Barcelona. So for the first time we move south and that has that is for a reason because as I was mentioning earlier, the viability of natural refrigerant in warmer climates is, is an, an issue that is tabled um, often. And so for the seventh time, and for the first time in Barcelona, we will have the Atmosphere Europe event. As I was saying before, also Australia, we will have a first event there next May to be confirmed. And Atmosphere America coming back for the fifth time. Maybe in Chicago, looks like Chicago and uh, looks like June, but still to be confirmed. So if you happen to be around any of these areas, um, please watch out for uh, my mailings or get in contact with us. Last but not least, as I was saying, the um, Guide North America is part of the Accelerate brand. Um, maybe you are not aware of the magazine we launched uh, last year. We launched it first for the North American market. It focuses really on the end users. We had eight editions launched so far. So if you are not aware of this, please check out the link you can find on this slide and, uh, and uh, start reading it. Following the success of the North American edition, we launched one in Japan, which isn't Japanese. So um, for those Japanese speakers that uh, can read uh, about the market developments there and excited also about this, um, we will launch a European magazine, which will be launched in November for the first time and then appear every quarter. What do we try to do with the webinars? As I was saying, it's the first one today we organized so we really want to use that tool to reach more industry stakeholders and, and other stakeholders involved in the discussion, work on global campaigns, stay up to date on the, on the publications, and more importantly, also provide a platform for other organizations. So what we don't want to do is just to present um, our activities or discuss uh, activities we are involved in, but we want to give the opportunity to other organizations to highlight their advances on natural refrigerant technology. So if you're interested um, in that, if you want to suggest topics and speakers, you can contact us at any time at webinar at checo.com. The recordings, uh, maybe some of you already asked a little bit about this. Recordings of today's webinar, the, uh, the presentation will be sent to you in the coming days.